Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, uh, we, we are we now. Are now there is there an is echo. echo. There is an echo. It's clear now. Yes. We. Good morning, everyone. We are now um, starting the thirteenth hearing of the one eighty seventh period of sessions of the Inter American Commission of Human Rights. And this hearing is entitled Obstetric Violence in the Americas. And it was requested by Miles of Chile, Catolicas por el Derecho a Decidir, Argentina, Promsec, Peru, GIRE, and the Centro de Derechos Reproductos, LAC. My name is Margaret May McCauley. I'm the president of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. And with me on the panel for the commission are the second vice president, Commissioner Roberta Clark, the Rapporteur for Women and the Country Rapporteur, Commissioner Julissa Mantilla, and Commissioner Joel Hernandez. Also present, at the hearing are the Executive Secretary, Madam Tanya Wuno, and Deputy Secretary for Monitoring, Maria Claudia Polido, and the Special Rapporteur for Economic, Social, Cultural, and Environmental Rights, Soledad Garcia Moniz. For the, those who are joining us online and are not on, on the um, panel itself, I just uh, mentioned the objective of this, this um, hearing, and that is to provide undated information on obstetric violence faced by women and pregnant women in the region, and the way in which states respond to their international obligations in this regard. The requesting organizations reinforce the need to recognize the existence of obstetric violence and to provide a legal definition of this phenomenon. And with that, I sincerely greet everyone who is present here today and thank all the members of civil society who have attended and of course the members of the commission who are here present and its secretariat. Let me explain the distribution of time so we can start. Civil society will have 25 minutes, the commission 25 minutes, then civil society will have a further 22 minutes to make comments or reply and or replies. And we I will then close in three minutes. So with that, I will now give the floor to civil society. Thank you. Buenos dias, honorable Good president. morning, Honorable Madam President, Mary McCauley, Executive Secretariat, uh, Tania Renault, Commissioner Roberta Clark, Commissioner Julissa Mantilla, Commissioner Joel Hernandez, Assistant uh, Secretary Maria Claudia Pulido, and Resca, Redesca um, Rapporteur Soledad Garcia Muñoz. My name is Car Carmen Cecilia Martinez. I am part of the Center of Reproductive Rights, LAC, and I have the honor of starting the presentation of the requesting organizations. This commission has indicated that obstetric violence is a form of violence that is manifested in any moment during the provision of maternal health services and that is prohibited by the Inter-American Treaties on Human Rights. In the previous two hearings on this matter in this before this commission, the Inter-American Court, uh, referring to developments by uh, special mechanisms of the United Nations and other organizations, has made progress um, taking into account the concept of obstetric violence. It did this in the cases Brides Sarce, defining this as a form of violence based on gender prohibited by the inter-American uh, human rights systems, including the Belém do Pará um, Convention, which is a 
perpetrated on pregnant persons during the their access to health services during the birth the pregnancy and the postpartum period which is expressed in an abusive and negligent assistance or treatment in denying information in forced or uh, coerced actions and the tendency to patholo pathologize different processes so there is a consensus that establishes that the states have the obligation to prevent and do not practice obstetric violence also we know that having a novel and broad standard is not enough if this is not implemented and if the causes that cause this are not uprooted this is why our liberty and our autonomy in terms of reproductive health has been historically limited or annulled with stereo with the basis on stereotype on gender stereotypes obstetric violence has to do with machist and stereotyped uh, violence this is generated in many occasions when pregnant persons are considered vulnerable or unfit to make decisions or that they are considered uh, someone only merely to reproduce and becoming pregnant has to imply suffering so eradicating gender stereotypes in health services continues to be a debt in our systems so i give the floor now to my colleague rebecca ramos directive uh, executive directive or of hire good morning among the obstetric violence actions that cause psychological harm our discriminatory act, uh, the use of insultive uh, languages during the provision of services, the lack of uh, timely information and dehumanized treatment. The physical uh, violence, our non-consent sterilization, the provision of uh, medicine without consent or delay of uh, urgent assistance. In Mexico, the public system has um people have have the majority of people who suffered obstetric violence in terms of disabilities women with disabilities that are the youngest are more likely to experience this sort of violence one out of two women a minor to 20 years has suffered one type of obstetric violence in the last birth to recognize this sort of violence has contributed to seeing it as a specific way of institutional and gender-based violence however including obstetric violence in criminal systems is a problem identifying it as a crime entails addressing these uh, behaviors through punitive actions and that creates this resistance among the health uh, staff that are facing adverse conditions to uh, provide their work for example in mexico the health um, community said the following the conditions of the current hospital infrastructure in our country does not allow to provide practices of accompanying women during pregnancy and after birth this infrastructure is one of the main factors that intervene in this complex process and the obstetricians and gynecologists are not involved the lack of essential resources and qualified staff are a reality and this is not a solution to focus on creating punitive laws so as they very well say criminalization does not solve obstetric violence as a structural problem it transforms it in an interpersonal conflict and the states do not focus on their obligation to solve the lack of infrastructure in hospitals in accompanying cases he has uh, pointed out that the health systems do not meet the needs of pregnant persons the state recognizes the experiences of women and they should guarantee that the violence acts do not uh, happen once again now i give the floor to rocia garcia garro of catholics for the right to decide of argentina 
Good morning, Commission. We are interested in saying that in the particular case of the Argentinian state, while before the British Arce ruling, there had been a human rights approach to address the legislation related to births and uh, postpartum, there are difficulties in their implementation in private and public uh, health systems. So Argentina incorporated the law to protect prevent and eradicate violence against women where violence, obstetric violence is defined as that violence exercised by the health staff on uh, pregnant persons and a pathologization of natural processes. In this law, there are reparation measures that are suggested, but not any criminal sanctions. However, the eradication and prevention of obstetric violence presents important challenges. The first of them, is that many uh, violent medical practices are, are seen uh, are happening frequently also the judicial system does not have the important information to address this topic and to propose measures to avoid the perpetration of this obstetric violence women who go through births and postpartum periods and are deprived of the liberty, according to data from 2021, more than 3,000 women between 18 and 45 years old are uh, in institutions and, and penitentiary institutions. And those women, women who are going through pregnancies report violence uh, all throughout the territory. According to reports by different organizations in 2019, 24% of the uh, surveyed women started to give birth in penitentiaries without any intimacy, without any protection, and in adverse health conditions. 30% reported having been assisted by um, a doctor that was not an obstetrician and they reported having been insulted during the, the their labor they were not transported in an ambulance and 54 percent reported they were transferred with uh being um tied so 75 percent reported that there was penitentiary system staff during their birth and while all of them were assisted with female staff, 79% reported that there were also men present. This situation is alarming because in prison, women are uh, in the hands of what penitentiary system staff decide, and they require the special attention on the part of the state so that the access to their rights is guaranteed. Now I give the floor to my colleague, Rosina Guerrero from Promsex Peru. Good morning, honorable members of the commission. Despite uh, the obstetric violence having been recognized in Peru as a modality of gender-based violence, and that in 2021, there was a technical norm issued to, for the elimination and prevention of uh, this violence in the health system, the Observatory of Gender Violence does not show any information to see the magnitude of this sort of violence, which we know is one of the most uh, natural uh, ways of violence. And while there is awareness and prevention suggested, we don't know if this is being implemented or any progress. And there is no uh, adequate mechanism to recognize, to, to acknowledge these cases. Health staff is exercising systematically obstetric violence acts in um, for all sorts of women being part of a, an indigenous people and using a native language can uh, worsen the exposition to this violence. The case of uh, Eulogia Guzman in, 20, in 2003 was transferred under threat to the uh, facilities in her location, locality. She was abandoned there and when she fi was finally assisted, they sh she was not allowed to give birth in their own uh, native way 
the birth uh, um, the, the newborn kid fell to the ground and and then uh, he finally died and so with this racism this was contrary with the uh, traditional birth uh, processes and also the controls were done in Spanish, a, a language that she, that she did not speak. She was asked to sign documents in Spanish so that she wouldn't uh, bring this to the court. All of this is uh, a form of obstetric violence. Since there was no justice in Peru, she filed a petition before the commission in 2009, case 12 point nine four five and while this is on the merits stage there has been 14 years since it was filed and she has been waiting for justice for 20 years this case is an example of structural violence to which indigenous women in peru are subjected not only during the pregnancy and the postpartum but throughout the sexual and reproductive health assistance they are discriminated for their uh, their ethnicity and their poverty status. So it's urgent to adopt measures to modify stereotypes, prejudices that happen in Peruvian health systems, which infringe the rights of women, especially indigenous women. It's, it's important to have data on the magnitude of this problem and to establish clear processes to have independent research and investigation on these cases so that cases such as the the case of Eulogia do, do not happen again. I give the floor to my colleague. Good morning, commissioners. Obstetric violence includes those practices that occur also in abortion in health services facilities. In Chile, um, there has been a unsanctioning of abortion, um, but there are practices that impact on human rights, especially when it comes to integrity and reproductive autonomy. These practices lead to irrespectful or abusive treatment, such as questioning the decision to have an abortion or an also violation of the medical secrecy. Also, we identified barriers to the process. So there is a denial to this right or they delay the process uh, especially this is contraproductive when there is a limit um, time to conduct the abortion by law the delay of the diagnosis or there are several exams the demanding of requirements apart from those required by law for example some additional tests and the objection by doctors in the public health system and the lack of medical staff in some regions uh, means that there are not enough professionals available to carry out this procedure. There are many women who want to access these health services, but they are victimized. Um, usually girls are the ones who expose to or situations. Um, a girl that is pregnant at 14 years old or below, um, that uh, is considered a violation. So the girl has the right to an abortion. But there are only 8.3% of the girls uh, who access this service. Also girls, face specific situations that lead to their re-victimization, such as the lack of knowledge by medical professionals about how they should proceed, or there are no available alternatives for the girls. And also, um, sometimes they try to evaluate if there was a violation, when in the case of girls, it is always a violation. So we need statistics in order to guarantee an effective implementation of the policy. The different secretaries and ministries have made assessments since the implementation of the law, but there are in the records only cases that have been recorded. So there is a lack of a human rights approach 
when it comes to this dissemination of information on gender violence and obstetric violence. Now I would like to give the floor to one of my colleagues. Good morning, everyone. I'm from the Grupo Medico for the Derecho a Res um, Decidir in Colombia. We would like to thank you for this opportunity to participate on, and to discuss obstetric violence. To mitigate obstetric violence, the health sector and professionals should recognize this type of violence against women, and there should be new regulations to guarantee um, a treatment that is respectful. Um, we know that uh, ending or terminating a pregnancy creates a lot of rejection among professionals. They don't want to be perpetrators. And this is because of their traditions and opinions, the ones that they were trained on during their careers. Secondly, obstetric violence cannot be misunderstood. Um, its eradication should be focused on a dignified treatment in recognizing the pregnant person as the one that is a holder of rights and it should be pencil person centered with a cultural approach and there shouldn't be a pathologization of several procedures and we should avoid negligent treatment it's important to understand that women and gestating persons can make decisions on their lives and their bodies. This respectful treatment requires that states promote education with a human rights approach that is transversal and mandatory for all health professionals. It is necessary also to raise awareness among health sectors in order to guarantee uh, dignified treatment, also education and empowerment of women and girls so that they can make the most of their reproductive processes and their life plans. Also, we need investment in terms of infrastructure uh, to guarantee the necessary staff in order to avoid work overload, also to guarantee the necessary resources for guaranteeing a proper treatment. Also, we would like to say that in Colombia, maternity rooms and pediatric rooms are being closed because of economic reasons. Regulation mechanisms we need to identify and monitor the quality of health care. Also, we need to have a system to report obstetric violence. There should be committees to follow up on the cases in institutions. And also we need to have a system of sanctions for those institutions that tolerate violence and for those professionals that commit serious acts. Finally, we would like to call upon countries so that they incorporate minimum care standards, dignified care, non-discriminatory care, non-stigmatizing care, autonomous care based on evidence, right to information, right to abortion, policies to avoid physical abuse, such as um, physical violence or deprivation of medication, policies to eradicate psychological abuse, such as threat, guilty, and humiliation. Thank you. Is that the last speaker for civil society? You've closed? Yes? Yes, thank you. Um, thank you very much. I now, um, and invite um, the country rapporteur uh, uh, and um, Lisa Mantilla to do her interventions. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Buenos días, señora presidente, presidenta. Inicio con un saludo muy cordial. Thank you. Good morning, Madam President. I would like to greet my colleagues and also the representatives of the civil society that are participating in such an important hearing. Thank you for being here, for getting ready for this hearing and also for your daily work. I also would like to thank you for the information that you are sharing with us. 
because um, the Inter-American Commission has worked in addressing obstetric violence even before uh, the case in the Inter-American Court. I have uh, a comment to make regarding criminal violence because we have also we have this punitive approach and when there is um, gender violence, this is um, transformed into a criminal type and it seems as if the problem is over after that. But we need to consider the expectations of the victims. Paula made a reference regarding health staff. So I would like to know if you have more information on the awareness and the education of health professionals at universities. I had a student in one of the master's degrees that was a doctor, and she told me that vertical delivery was what was better for women, but not for doctors. So I would like to know if after so many years, I would like to know if there are any education, especially in the area of maternity. I also would like to ask you about some aspects regarding intersectionality. We would like to know what is happening, for example, when it comes to obstetric violence and racism, not only for indigenous peoples, but also for uh, Afro-descendant women and also for um, women with disabilities. We would like to know also the situation of uh, women adolescents. And also we would like to know about violence against trans persons. And finally, I would like to know the challenges that you as uh, reproductive rights defenders are facing. Those who defend women's rights end up being suffering a stigma, threats, and other types of violence. So if at this hearing you can talk about the challenges that you face because you make this um, facts of obstetric violence visible, it would be great. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you. I now invite the second Vice President, um, Roberto Clark, to intervene. Thank you. Thank you very much and good morning to everyone. And really, um, thank you for all of the information that you've given us. I was thinking as we were all talking, as I, I was listening and you were talking, that this is one of the great ironies of this very gendered life that we live, which is that on one hand, the maternal role for women is so prioritized for them. Yet on the other hand, women are treated sometimes the worst at times of um, uh, in, their, in their maternity cycle. Um, either the treatment can be quite indifferent, inadequate, poor quality, um, delayed, missing, and of course, uh, the experience of obstetric care very much varies, as um, uh, Julie has pointed out, by intersectional factors. But certainly, uh, poor women don't get treatment, um, and they often are quite far away from access to quality services, essential services. So I just wanted to say that this is, you know, one of the ironies that we have to keep speaking about when we're talking about gender equality, because it really is uh, so foundational in understanding how women get to uh, live their life project, as you call it. I wanted to, and, and, and I agree with everything, I understand everything that you've said. I wanted to ask in the, all of you gave some examples of obstetric violence. And I was wondering, do you all also come across, um, as we do in the Caribbean uh, here, the denial, for example, of some services, uh, such as tubal ligations, so women who go to have tubal ligations because they decided they don't want children, they may be asked, has your husband consented? And in fact, they may well be denied actually their own autonomy over their own bodies. And I was wondering if you all uh, have any experience of that and whether you have that documented. And then all of the factors that you point to, delayed services, inadequate services, um, insulting um, and disrespectful services, all of that of stigmatizing uh, services, all of that undermines the quality of care. Have you all been able to track the rates of maternal mortality 
and also maternal mortality by the factors um, that uh, Commissioner Mantia has raised, maternal mortality of Afro-descendants, of indigenous women, trans women. Is there any data available um, that would give us some idea of you know, the statistics that underpin uh, obstetric uh, violence and therefore also will help us think about what, to, what the policy responses should be? Thank you. Thank you, um, um, my sister Roboso. I now invite uh, Commissioner Joel Hernandez to make his interventions, if any. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. I would like to say first that I feel honored to be on this hearing in which uh, all participants are women human rights defenders. And Together with my colleagues, the uh, commissioners, executive secretary, the assistant executive secretary, and the special rapporteur are all women human rights defenders. So I feel proud to be together with you. Um, for me, it has been very enriching to be here and to listen to your different interventions, to be able to understand better this additional layer of violence against women that is obstetric violence. And we are forced to have deeper perspectives from our country rapporteurships when we monitor the situation of human rights in each state. I would like to limit my comments to two specific aspects. One that is more related to the mandate of human rights defenders and how is your work in the ground, in the field. I would like to know the challenges that you face as human rights defenders and as women rights defenders, if you have been able to exercise your work um, in a free way. Also, I would like to say that I'm really shocked by the case that Rosina Guerrero mentioned, that is a case against Peru. And I would like to recall the recent international recognition pronouncement by President Boris in a friendly settlement in the case of Francisca. It was a sterilization of a woman who lived with HIV and the Center of Reproductive Rights had a fundamental role. As country reporter for Chile, uh, experiencing uh, this was a very important moment for me in, man, in May last year. It was great to be during that act of recognition. I learned about Francisca's life. Uh, I listened to another because she decided to remain anonymous. And why, why am I mentioning this? Francisca waited a long time in the inter-American system, but she found comprehensive reparation through a friendly settlement. Of course, both parties need to be willing. The state and the petitioner should be willing to find a solution, but we can guarantee reparation when we have that will. That would be all on my side, Madam President. Thank you very much, um, <clears throat> I'm, I must say that when I saw that we had you present, I was very chuffed and, and happy about it. Um, for you to represent our brothers, the, ma uh, the male part um, in this hearing. It's very important to have that. Thank you. I now invite the executive secretary um, to make her intervention. Buenos dias, eh, Presidenta. Buenos dias. Eh, good morning, Madam President. Good morning, Commissioners. And good morning to um, participants from the civil society for those who are participating at this hearing that um, makes a very serious problem visible. The commission has pronounced on several occasions about this matter through press releases. I'm thinking about Bolivia in 2021 when it came to sexual and reproductive rights of girls and boys. El Salvador, when it comes to access to the criminal system 
when it comes to the full prohibition of abortion and we presented a criticism towards that. We also presented the case of Beatriz. We also pronounced on the results of the Supreme Court of Justice regarding Robert uh, versus Wade and how there was a important regression in this area. So in the region, we are seeing important regressions. And I would like to ask you that if you, within this context that is so important for the life of women, I would like to know if you find or have identified any best practice that the commission and the executive secretariat can follow up on. Because when it comes to the mandate of technical cooperation of the Inter-American Commission, we need to see how we can transfer and we can collect and communicate best practices. These cases that you are mentioning represent the history of a person, but probably they are the stories of several women in the region. These cases show uh, systematic practices that should be eradicated. And as Commissioner Clark, there is a great level of controversy between uh, the right to life and the treatment received by gestating persons. So I would like to know if in the executive secretariat you have identified any best practice or any law that we should explore or any administrative procedure that is relevant to guarantee the health or the reproductive and obstetric health of women. Thank you. And thank you for this hearing. Thank you very much, um, uh, Executive Secretary. I now invite uh, Deputy Executive Secretary for monitoring um, to make her intervention. Could we go back to the original screen, please? Madam Secretary, eh, Madam President, eh, yo me uno a las palabras de la secretaria. Madam Secretary, I uh, echo uh, Tania's uh, words, so I thank you for giving me the floor, but that's my comment. Oh, thank you. Uh, but could we go back to the original screen? I, I I find it difficult when I do not see the people I'm I'm wishing to call on. Um, anyway, I now invite our special rapporteur, uh, um, um, Soledad, uh, to uh, Manos to make her intervention, a special rapporteur on economic, social, cultural, and environmental rights. If she's still on, please take us back to the original screen. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Madam President. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good morning. Thank you very much. Congratulations for granting this hearing because it's very important also for the special rapporteurship as uh, it has a special mandate in terms of uh, the right to health, considering that obstetric violence represents a serious violation of the right to life and the right to health of women and also of the sexual and reproductive rights. I also echo the words of Commissioner Clark on this extreme contradiction that we see in this topic. And also I would like to add a comment and two questions. First, obstetric violence is affecting disproportionately and seriously to women who are in vulnerable situations such as indigenous women and women who live in poverty or in extreme poverty who do not have access to health systems and nonetheless and, and not even to novel technologies but also it affects all women of all social levels in our region and in the world and in fact we must all have heard uh, a case of a close person having uh, gone through this because this goes on hand with dehumanization and machism which unfortunately are part of the excess of medicine still so how as the requesting organization said the training of health system uh, staff and also uh, educating women is very important and also i would like to ask ask of the impact on 
mental health for women who went through these uh, violences? Because I know that obstetric violence in all its forms creates serious impacts and trauma for women. And secondly, I wanted to ask on what you said, what you called the use of unnecessary practices such as uh, C-sections. In that case, I would like to know if you have any data on the practices of C-sections and the impact on the re future reproductive health of women and the health of the babies who are born through this unnecessary C-sections, because I have read some studies on this uh, issue. Thank you very much, Madam President, and thank you all for your important contributions. Thank you very much, uh, Special Rapporteur. I'll just make a, <clears throat> excuse me. I'll just make a, a few um, short comments. And um, one is that um, I agree with what my sister Roberta said. It is, it's always bemused me that uh, um, there is so much focus paid by men in positions of leadership, especially to our sexual reproductive um, um, health, our bodies in that way, when the issue of termination of pregnancy is, is, is being dealt with. And yet, I am, as um, someone in speaking said that the, the fact of our, um, our pregnancy and so on is important and how we're treated is important for the life of women. But I disagree. I think it is important for every human person in the world. It's important for women and men. And yet we are suffering regressions in the respect which ought to be paid to every single facet when it comes to sexual reproductive health and the rights of women. And I am disappointed that we have not really mentioned enough the Afro-descendant women and the treatment which they receive. They are the bottom of the ladder in every respect and in this particular respect of aesthetic violence. And I, I would I would be most grateful if we could hear something uh, um, more about them, um, um, both from civil society and indeed with Esther. Um, and I think that we have to look on uh, obstetric violence and the cases that I know of from the degrees of culpability of the perpetrators. These are people who are trained as medical doctors. And one of the basic facets of their profession is do no harm. And yet they do to women. The majority of cases, they intentionally decide, for instance, to do hysterectomy procedures. They intentionally decide to tie the, 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 the uh, women up and prevent, to prevent them having any more problems. They do not get the woman's consent. They decide. So that degree is an intentional act. Then you have the others which are mere incompetence and negligence. Then you have the others who act because they really do not care how they perform in the procedure. And of course, there are others who take good care of women. We have to mention those. But the numbers are increasing of doctors who intentionally take away the decision from a woman as to what should be done to her. Because first of all, they do not explain the health situation to her or discuss it. Yes, we know of the difficulty of language and otherwise which exists. Uh, um, when they do not have interpreters present, when the, clearly they cannot understand the woman and the woman cannot understand them. And no hospital should allow a procedure to go through 
on, on that basis. So the doctor themselves are, are culpable. The hospital authorities are culpable. The state is culpable in those circumstances. I, I think we ought to deal with this matter more frequently. We haven't had enough hearings um, um, of them. And we ought to have more hearings in these matters, definitely, to highlight the continuity and the degree in uh, which is, uh, is the degree of greater cases occurring in the regressive attitudes of some in so many states in which men believe that they can take over the lives of women in this particular instance of their health. And in, in, in the circumstances which, as I say, affect not only women themselves who suffer gravely, but the rest of humanity. So I, I, I hope that we, the commission, can assist you and work with you hand in hand um, to, to, to have, have these things um, attended to uh, and, and, and get some particular results that we would like to see. Because we have to move strongly in this matter. Otherwise, no, 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 bring it back. O otherwise, I, uh, um, we will not, we, they would get away with their, in their control, because that basically is what they want to do, is to control our sexual reproductive rights with respect to what happens to us during pregnancy or when we, we, have, we decide or need to have termination, um, but they do not have the right to decide for us. That we have to make clear. And it has to be accepted by the states and the states have to impose that standard. And that is, that is all I have to do and I thank you all. Um, for your uh, um, uh, presentations this morning. I just want to, to invite civil society for the rest of the, the, uh, the period of time. I think you have 22 minutes, but you will have the additional minutes of the, the commission as well. So thank you, please, I give you the floor. I'll, I'll start then. Thank you very much for your reflections, your, your comments and your questions. I will try to answer some of those questions that you post. First, as regards training for uh, doctors and best practices. And as if the, we have observed any progress in training for health professionals and especially doctors on obstetric violence. In the last few years, we cannot deny that this topic is being discussed. There have been some progress related to speaking about these topics in academia. It, People tend to speak about human uh, human uh, treatment or human births than actually uh, confronting professionals with the concept of obstetric violence because it seems that there's a fear of creating uh, a, a backlash. However, what we can observe, at least in Colombia, is that training is uh, unequal, I would call it, that is, in some universities, there is training and in others, there's not. In some health professionals, such as a nursery, for example, uh, for, for nurses, uh, this is uh, insufficient, but also this is, uh, this is not articulated with practice. While they are given courses on human treatment, when you go to the birth words you see the, the assistance that was traditionally learned right it's hierarchical and and it's not 
humanized. So that treatment, th th that training is not related, it's not in connection with the real change in practice. So to, to further comment on what I had already mentioned as of what could be done to have best practices or a respectful obstetric assistance on top of, of training, uh, the, the issue of infrastructure and health systems and the responsibility of states and institutions is important because in Colombia, the maternity wards are being closed and there is more overcrowding and overburden of professionals. So instead of creating protocols, which uh, sometimes is, is the result of this new uh, ways of, of training, uh, instead of doing doing those protocols, what we have to do is to change the thinking and the paradigm of the professionals who assist women with the idea that they are the ones who know what's best for the women or for the birth. So what's most important to me is this change of mentality towards a respectful uh, perspective on of women. So that women can exercise their own beliefs and their own um, religions. So in, instead of having a checklist of things that we should and shouldn't do. As regards trans men, In Bogota, there is a survey by the Secretariat of Health where they report that during gynecologist and obstetric uh, assistance, most trans men or non-binary persons that were assigned as female at birth were felt uh, violated by, by they, they felt violence and they received a mocking or they questioned their identity. And they also felt, uh, for example, uh, that some some treatment or, or or touching by the professional was not consented by them. As regards maternal mortality in Colombia, before concluding and giving the floor to my colleagues, I would like to mention that maternal mortality doubled with the pandemic. In 2022, it was 41.4% per 100,000 uh, people who were born alive. And this is double for Afro-descendant women and triple for indigenous women. I think this data speaks for itself how obstetric violence not only has to do with the behavior of professionals, but also with a structural and state problem that is very serious. And as regards mental health, we don't have official data. Recent research uh, by Human Rights Collective shows that mental health can be affected in different ways. They speak of a possibility of a post-traumatic stress related with the uh, trauma lived through birth. Also, we see that suicide is the first or the second indirect uh, cause of death for mothers in the Americas, which happens fundamentally during postpartum period. And that really has to make us reflect upon the relationship of that with obstetric violence. I give the floor to my colleague, Rosina, so that she can continue with the answers to your questions. Thank you very much. Something that we noticed at this hearing is the lack of data in some countries, particularly in the countries where data is being gathered, this is insufficient because it's not disaggregated per, uh, by ethnicity or language, for example, for the women who are affected. So in that sense, it's important to acknowledge that in the case of Peru, the ombudsperson's office have issued um, a report where they show that belonging to an indigenous group or an Afro-descendant group or a Quechua speaking group exposes women more frequently to this sort of violence. So 
This is why we make a calling for the states to improve the quality and register more data so that they make visible the magnitude of the problem in countries where there are big uh, indigenous populations, especially in our country, such as in Peru. In the countries of the Americas, with regard to the lack of information, yes, we have managed to have some particular uh, data with relation to indigenous women, which is that there is no cultural perspective in their assistance. There, there is they do not respect traditional practices to have the deliveries under the postpartum period. Women have been threatened because they do not go to deliver their babies to a um, health facility, and so they do not give them the birth certificate of their children. Also, um, sometimes, uh, health staff threatens uh, uh, community members if they do not take indigenous women to the hospital. So cultural traditions being uh, in opposition with quality assistance is a very a serious debt and this is what indigenous women this is what makes indigenous women uh not resorting to health services so there is an an urgency to work on uh cultural adequacy of the services and for example in a recent uh, ombudsperson's office report on the quality of access to services the Quechua speaking um, women do not find health professionals speaking in their language. And that is uh, infringing the right of information for women, which is also a form of violence against them. What I could point to is that during C uh, as regards C sections, the region has a a high percentage of C-sections in general. The, uh, there's a recommendation of between 10 to 15% of C-sections, but the region shows 40% of C-sections. In Peru, in some regions, the percentage accounts for 49% of procedures. All C-sections are concentrated or, or take place in the coastal region of the country, in the urban and coastal regions. There's a difference of almost 23% between rural and urban um, regions in terms of C-section procedures. And as we have uh, gathered testimonies of women health professionals, we see that the position uh, for, uh, for the delivery is denied by the health professional at the moment of the, of the birth. On mental health, we conducted a a report on obstetric violence on women who had uh, who delivered dead fetuses. And what we found was an Im impact on health, on mental health. Is, this is what we, women reported, the impact that they had, uh, uh, sadness, insomnia, anxiety, not being not wanting to eat, not wanting to get up from bed, in isolation from their family. They uh, are losing their partners, for example, or breaking up or acute stress, stress throughout the process. And most of these women, after one year, one, one year later from that uh, situation, they continue to show uh, depression, anxiety, and post-traumatic traumatic stress. So this is what I wanted to comment on this. And also what Commissioner Hernandez said in the case of Mrs. Eulogia was addressed by Promsex. We are legal representatives of Mrs. Eulogia and we want to continue with the procedures so that Eulogia 
truly receives justice. So thank you very much for highlighting the case. It's something that we also want to do to comment uh, on this hearing. I give the floor to my colleague now, who will also answer some questions. I just want to supplement what Rosina said. And in terms of mental health, uh, we did a survey in Chile and 64.2% of women who receive obstetric violence believe that their mental health was affected. Also, there is a figure that indicates that 79% of women indicate that they suffer psychological violence. That is to supplement the information that we have, um, especially when it comes to the challenges. I will try to explain the ones that are most important. With regard to access to information, uh, as civil society organizations, we face these information gaps because of the lack of available information, um, but also because of the delays to have access to that information when we request information from the state. When we have that information, information is not disaggregated. There is no gender perspective. There is no human rights approach when dealing with that information. So for us, it's very difficult to do a monitoring and to evaluate the country situation. Also, we face um, that there is a lack of services in the state in order to provide support to the reports of obstetric violence. So since there are no state, state services, the civil society needs to uh, try to bridge the gap. So we try to support those persons who need to go to justice or need support when their rights have been violated. Also, we suffer attacks in our work in Chile. Uh, a Profas Health Center was attacked and our organization, Mile, and our director and our lawyer have been attacked. That is a serious situation. Also in the case of Chile, we have faced um, 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 anti-right movement. Um, and this has affected the public opinion. And also this has had an effect on the legislative landscape. We see that there are several bills that could violate the principle of non-regressiveness in the matter. And now, um, um, sometimes we have challenges when it comes to the definition of obstetric violence, because it seems that it's only related to delivery and to postpartum, but we need to see the violence that is suffered by gestating persons across the whole life cycle. So that is what I wanted to add. Now I would like to give the floor to my colleague, Rebecca. Thank you, Javi. Uh, in terms of data, Hiram has seen that although we could say that mente proporcional esto no siempre así no es no es siempre así ya que hay factores como el acceso a recursos hospitalarios que desempeñan un papel muy importante like that because there are some health centers desarrollando una metodología muy sencilla con el objetivo de concentrar la información methodology in order to con un poco eh, cerrar con el tema de eh, la razón de muerte materna que eh, lee la, los casos maternal de death and en el México la encuesta nacional sobre dinámica de las relaciones en los hogares en términos de, de violencia obstétrica and y en el caso específico en donde la, la relatora eh, Roberta Clark preguntaba sobre eh, Roberta Clark asked about uh, the consent that is required uh, by partners, what we see is that when it comes to tubal ligation, contraception, supplies, the pregnant person is not asked about that but the consent of the partner is required. In Mexico, there is a case solved by the Supreme Court of Justice recently, is the case of Sonia, 
and the Supreme Court analyzed a situation in which there was no prior and informed consent of this woman to receive permanent contraception. And for that, the court made a very important analysis to uh, assess the elements that we know about informed consent, but also the Supreme Court said that said to the authorities that the lack of compliance with informed consent and access to information um, was required. Um, and that a document signed by the person without informing the person about the practice could not be considered, uh, can, could not be considered as a prior informed consent. So now I would like to give the floor to my colleague, Rosy Garcia. Thank you. I want to be very brief because uh, we don't have much time left. So I would like to talk about uh, termination of pregnancy and obstetric violence. In the case of Argentina, as it has been mentioned, approximately 79 percent of the reports talked about psychological violence. And when it comes to obstetric violence for the termination of pregnancy, we see that there is psychological violence, ill treatment and denial of attention. When there is a denial of attention and hospitals do not receive um, the users, this leads to a situation of obstetric practices at home. And this worsens um, the delivery and also worsens the situation of criminalization of these women. When we talk about the challenges that we face, we see that there is an excessive level of criminalization in Argentina against the users of the system and against um, defenders. In Argentina, um, defenders, doctors who um, comply with the right to the voluntary termination of pregnancy are criminalized and sometimes they end up being prosecuted. This is a very uh, a situation of great concern for us. And now I would like to give the floor to my colleague from the Center of Reproductive Rights. Thank you, Rocio. I just would like to add that, or to add a little of information when it comes to the questions related to mental health. De, de cinco casos en particular de niñas eh, que justamente están ahora, bueno, uno ya actuó una decisión, que es el caso de Camila, litigado por Pronsex y otros cuatro que están esperando decisiones del Comité de Derechos Humanos, pero el, pun el punto es que ellas cuatro, ellas cinco, enfrentaron, digamos, eh, embarazos, productos de violación. Eh, y cuatro de ellas eh, se vieron eh, forzadas pues, a continuar. To the translation? Sorry. Ok, thank you. I so, haven't heard anything. No, please, sorry. Um, Hello? Hi, can you hear me? Hello, hello. Can you hear me? No. Can you what can you happened? speak in Spanish, uh, Carmen? Because otherwise, uh, the pr the president wants to hear. But now you can hear me, right? Yes, I can hear you now. I didn't know she thought he was she was starting in English. <laughs> no, pensé que no me escuchaban. Por eso. Sorry, I thought you weren't uh, listening to me, so I started speaking English in, in English. Sorry. So I was I saying was that this. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, les so I was saying that these four girls that we are representing who were pregnant and faced forced maternity four of them the four of them when they had to go to their pregnancy checkups they were 
they were very affected of what they for what they were living and for the four of them were uh, asked why they were complaining if the, before they had opened up their legs so they were told this uh, serious insults and and abusive comments and being adults now they remember with very um with so much pain, these comments, but during the, their pregnancy, when they were about to deliver the, their babies, they were very, very afraid of going back to that health center that where they had been so mistreated. So I don't think this is, um, this is not random. In one of those countries I'm speaking about, Guatemala, the second cause for maternity deaths in girls is suicide so that on the one hand then i also remember as regards what you asked of the challenges that we are facing historically in our region and very recently there has been a migration crisis, very serious migration crisis. And so access to maternal health services has been limited for uh, migrant women in Colombia, particularly. And we have received information on, on people from Haiti uh, crossing the border to seek assistance in Dominican Republic. So the refusal to to grant access to maternal health is very uh, central. And when they access that health, well, obstetric violence is really prevailing against migrant women. Here in Colombia, there was also an article that was uh, published that unfortunately was very famous. Well, the title read, Stop. Uh, giving birth to, to Venezuelan women. So that stigma prevails on the relationship with gender-based stereotypes is very uh, important. So in order to conclude, Rosina, when she mentioned the case of Veologia, well, that made me think of all these years that have gone by in her case. And this happens in many cases to, to get reparation for women. And that makes me think in, in this particular topic of such violence for over a decade, the World Health Organization uh, recommended states to have a respectful uh, treatment of the birth and postpartum periods. Also, there was a sentence that uh, the case Alina da Silva Pimentel Texeira v. Brazil, an Afro-Brazilian woman who died because she did not have access to health a quality maternal health systems. This was um, sentenced at the international level. The Britas Arce died 30 years ago in the hospital of Buenos Aires and her family members uh, received this ruling three decades afterwards. So th this time is not random. We believe that obstetric violence is and has been a form of violence that is not visible, is not being discussed, is one of the gender-based violence that is the most prevailing and can become worsened against children, um, Afro-descendants, migrants, people with disabilities, LGBT, LGBTIQ plus persons. So this is why it's necessary to prevent cases with an intersectional approach to make visible the different factors that are involved in this institutional and gender-based uh, violence scheme. So the, the requesting organizations consider that it's urgent to raise awareness on obstetric violence to 
build communication channels and to gather data, because if we do not have any statistics or details on the modalities of obstetric violence, it will be hard, not to say impossible, to design efficient policies to eradicate this violence. And also, we believe that this honorable commission can play a key role by uh, requesting states to prevent and address obstetric violence. So we respectfully request from the commission to request information on this topic, to include this in this thematic agenda on their in loco visits in their uh, annual report, and also, if possible, to issue a thematic report on this issue. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, I, now is, I now should close this um, hearing. And I just have to say this, that you, your last request is certainly extremely on point. And we do, we should assist. And perhaps um, we can, um, the commissioners and, and the board and the executive secretariat can consider um, sending Article 41 letters and those countries um, um, which have not ratified the Convention, Article 18 letters, requesting specific information about ob obstetric violence, all the facets of what we need so that we can have data uh, um, um, on them. And if countries are not paying attention to keeping data, then we'll have to insist and recommend that they must set up a procedures in order to, for data to be uh, um, um, gotten. And secondly, I think we ought to ask uh, um, um, the specific questions vis-a-vis uh, um, the conduct of doctors and what happens to them. I should say, as I, 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 in my practice in common law uh, um, jurisdiction, proving medical negligence is one of the most difficult things to do because you cannot get the medical evidence from other doctors within the same jurisdiction to come and give evidence in the cases. And so you, you only if you can get evidence from outside the jurisdiction, foreign experts to come in, which is extremely uh, expensive, can you then pursue medical negligence cases and successfully so. So it is a matter of grave importance that we really have to work together on. And, and um, I'm sure we, we will discuss this as soon as possible within the commission and contact you again. Thank you very much for bringing the matter to, to us and, uh, and, and for proceeding with this hearing. And we wish both of us, the commission and you in your work, all the very best and all success in this regard. It is very important for not only women, but for the future of mankind. Thank you. All the best. I'm sorry. Bye. I've called yeah. this. This a meeting photo. is at an end. But don't Gracias. turn off your cameras Gracias. yet. We have to photograph. Yes. Sí. Okay. Hola, todas. Yeah. Todos. Si pueden prender sus cameras, if you can turn on your cameras. And and look to the cameras, please. Perfect. Thank you so much. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Hasta luego. Gracias. Hasta luego.